You're all good. Hi, this is Sachi Yonari Rizzo, Curator of Prints and Drawings at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art. And every other month I host a print talk, a talk in the Print and Study Drawing Center, um, focusing on a single artist in the collection that we're fortunate enough to have more than um, one work by so that we can look at his or her work in greater depth. Um, today we're gonna talk about John Quick to see Smith. And I'm joined here with Caitlin Binkley, who is our Director of Visual Communications, who will help with any technical difficulties or field questions. <laughs> and Caitlin's, you can just kind of see her hand. And I will go ahead and start our presentation. And usually I walk you around the Print and Drawing Study Center, but um, today, since we're all virtual, I'm going to go ahead and do a PowerPoint for you. And I'm excited about this because I can give you tons more images, more than you've ever wanted to know. So this is a photograph of Jean Quick to see Smith. Um, she was born in 1940 and is an enrolled member of the Confederated Salish and Katune tribes of the Flathead Nation. Her heritage is Cree, Shoshone, and French. Her first name is Jean, meaning yellow, maybe a nod to her French heritage. Um, her father named her Quick to See, which is taken from her grandmother's name. Um, it's less about having keen eyesight and more so about the ability to grasp things readily. And we'll see that, um, that cleverness and that ability of her sight um, in her works. Like many, of her art, many other artists, she was always drawing, but when Quick to See Smith attended college, she was directed towards a career of teaching. She was told that women cannot be artists Many women of her generation face similar um, experiences. People like Faith Ringgold had the same experience. She, Quick to see Smith said, the year that professor told me that I could not be an artist was 1958. My art classes were all men receiving the GI Bill from the Korean War. And the instructor told me that I could, I could draw better than the men, but that women could not be artists. He said I could be a teacher. So in 76, she received her bachelor's degree in art education from Framingham State College in Massachusetts. Um, in 1980, she earned a master's degree in art from the University of New Mexico, as it was the only institution um, of higher education at that time that had a comprehensive program in Native American studies. Um, she's well known for her paintings and mixed media collages the Fort Wayne Museum of Art has one drawing and several prints. Um, she is a very prolific printmaker. Um, I have a list that uh, an art dealer com um, compiled in 2014, and there were at that point 100 different prints on the checklist. We'll look at some of the prints in our collection. This one is entitled Hunter of the Hungry Horse from 1979, and it's amongst her earliest prints. Um, it's very small. Um, I included the dimensions um, on the, the object information because you're not seeing these in person. So it's very small, only about nine, nine by seven. And here's kind of a close up. Um, you can see, maybe you can see areas like this that look not quite solid. It has kind of a grainy quality to it. And that's the aquatint. Um, it's an etching and aquatint. Um, and we see that the piece is made up of simple blocks of color. We have little stray black markings, perhaps signifying grasses, plants, um, different vegetation. There's also some triangular shapes, maybe referencing lodges or different types of dwellings. And it reads pretty much like an abstracted landscape seen from the air, um, reminiscent of a map. Sorry, I, I seem to keep fading in and out of the background back here. Oh, <laughs> I'm like sorry. a ghost. <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> but you see me. <laughs> I'm not moving. Um, I also included another pastel drawing as a comparison. This is Waloa Waterholes from the Waloa Waterhole series, and she created these pastel drawings and. Um, they were supposed to be understood as sort of personal memory maps. Maybe these are places that she had visited. Some other titles um, in the, um, of other works include Porcupine Ridge, uh, Kalispell. And what I did find was that these are all locations, actual locations in Montana, although 
Wallola is um, in the Oregon Valley. Um, there seems to be this, you can see this direct um, correspondence between her drawings and prints with the um, color fields, whether it's grasslands, uh, maybe some water, and then the graphic marks tracing travel maybe of you know, different animals and humans. And she is very much interested in the relationship between people and the land that they inhabit. And, and this is probably a little blurry for you. This was um, scanned from slides. This is from an exhibition in 1987 that the Fort Moyne Museum of Art organized entitled Eight Native American Artists. And it was curated then by Emily Cass, who was then director and had just recently relocated from Albuquerque. Um, this is the title wall. Um, you might recognize the sculpture on the left-hand side, the bronze piece. We did acquire that from the um, exhibition. That's by Truman Lowe. Um, it also featured the work of Emmy Whitehorse, whose work is in our collection. Um, and here's next is an installation view. Um, I'm assuming Quick Disease Smith's work is along the wall, the shorter wall, and maybe possibly on the taller white wall. Um, she was a she's she is an accomplished artist, but she's also an artist advocate. She worked hard to create opportunities to promote promote artists who were greatly overlooked, specifically Native American female artists. Um, we already know that she was guided towards being a teacher. She had to apply to grad school three times to get her MFA at University of New Mexico, discouraged since she was Native American. But after an exhibition at the Cornbly Gallery that was reviewed in the art journal Art in America, she was finally accepted. And then amongst the artists she learned about in school were all white men. Um, she gradually encountered the work though of Georgia O'Keeffe and people like Kata Colvitz. She had said in the mid 1970s, when I began curating or organizing exhibitions for native, native artists, it was about having contemporary native art scene. There were pots, blankets, jewelry, and IAIA, which is the, um, the Institute for American Indian um, Arts, their paintings and sculpture being shown in Santa Fe at the time, but those of us who were educated in mainstream universities were being ignored, and we still are nearly 40 years later. So she would curate these numerous exhibitions, often in alternative spaces, and she founded artist groups such as Coop Marks. Um, it's an artist co-op at the Flathead Reservation and Gray Canyon Artists, and that was named for how Albuquerque streets look like canyons of cement. And Quick to See Smith um, did other things like help raise funds for scholarships, library books for her reservation, um, their community college founded by her cousin. And in 1985, she and artist Harmony Hammond curated the first exhibition of contemporary Native American women artists. So she's an important artist and advocate and we'll soon see as an activist as well. Um, the piece we acquired out of the eight Native American artist show is Dreamtime. Um, it's a pastel on paper from 1986, and it's larger than the print we just previously saw, almost 30 by 22 inches. Um, we see how the artist used pastel to create these really beautiful feathery strokes and these softly blended areas. Um, she used all earth tones, and we see fragments of mountains, figures, and horses that are in different scales and hover in space. And she avoided traditional Western perspective. And you might think that her drawing style reflects her interest in rock petroglyphs, which are rock carvings, uh, or pictographs, rock paintings, and traditional Native American artifacts. And she fills the entire sheet with all these different marks reminiscent of what we call in art history horror vacui uh, meaning a dislike for for having empty spaces but by doing so with this composition she creates this vibration energy and a sense of movement in the landscape in 1992 she explained i think of my work as an inhabited landscape never static or empty euro americans see broad expanses of land as vast empty spaces Indian people see all land as a living entity. The wind ruffles the grass, ants crawl, a rabbit burrows. And we see also there's a prominence of horses in the drawing um, in uh, at least four different areas. Um, one, one area has a group of perhaps 
to, to um, horses, perhaps referring to a herd. She said, beginning in the late 1700s, when horses appeared, her tribe developed some of the largest and finest herds of horses in the region. And it's also interesting to note that her father was a horse trader, a rodeo rider, and a trainer, and is said to have ridden a horse before he could even walk. And then you'll, find, you'll also find horses in um, rock petroglyphs as well. I included this other um, installation shot of her petroglyph, petroglyph park series from 1985 to 87. And this is taken from the George O'Keefe Museum um, in an exhibition just recently this summer. Um, so at the si same time as our pastel piece on the left, Dreamtime, she was painting her petroglyph park series um, and also created several pastel drawings. So maybe Dreamtime is one of these drawings um, that were all made in response to the threat of development of a suburban housing complex. Um, the threat was against a 17 mile stretch of, of land along Ur Albuquerque. And I'm assuming it's the Petroglyph National Monument that was since established in 1990. Um, it is a sacred site to indigenous peoples where over 20,000 ancient petroglyphs are carved into volcanic rock. And she and other artists fought to protect this area. And so we'll increasingly see how her work is becomes politically more, more overt. Um, this is another piece in our collection. Um, it's a motto type, Ceci Nespa Un Peace Pipe from 1993. And I've arranged these chronologically as well. So we have a nice sampling of her works throughout her career. So with a monotype, um, the artist can create this, these wonderful painterly areas. And you see that quality in the, in the um, fields of black and the peach color. Um, for the monotype process, you use smooth, a smooth non-porous surface such as glass. And this is for your matrix or your base. So in a woodcut, your matrix would be a block of wood. But in this case, it's traditionally, typically glass. The artist creates an image out of ink or paint on this matrix. So you can use a brush or you can manipulate it with you know, your finger or different instruments. Is then transferred to paper using a unique impression, making creating a unique impression, hence the name monotype. Um, so you can transfer it either by hand, you know, using like a spoon to transfer the ink on the back or else through a, a printer's press. And sometimes there's enough trace remnants of the paint or ink on the matrix from the first printing to create a second impression. Um, this is referred to as a ghost print. So this is a really easy way of printmaking for a painter. If you don't have much printmaking experience, the process is very um, immediate with the mark making. Um, it's interesting to note though, um, that this print, although it is a monotype, it, it exists in an addition of six variant impressions. Um, this is contrary to what I just told you about the monotype um, process um, yielding just one. Um, but the master printer, Maurice Sanchez, who collaborated with the artist, um, developed a process in which the paint and monotype plate is sealed and only a portion of the available ink is pulled for each impression. So you'll have small variances with the impressions, but they're all pulled from the same monotype plate. And um, what we'll notice is that we have this thought balloon in the piece and um, we have a Native American um, you know, thinking. So my guess is that this, is, this piece is more from a Native American perspective. If the title sounds very familiar or the wording, it's probably because you've seen Rene Magritte, the Belgian surrealist's famous painting, The Treachery of Images. This is not a pipe. Um, in his painting, obviously, we're seeing a very highly realistically painted pipe floating in space, but it's not actually a physical pipe. Um, it's just an image of one. And Magritte suggests that our desire to call the image a pipe may show our tendency to confuse the image with the thing it represents. And she's inserted the word peace into the, into um, Magritte's um, statement. So perhaps it's maybe her thought is we confuse the image of peace in the peace pipe with what actually happened in history. And 
included a, a photograph of Red, Chief Red Cloud because he has a peace pipe. And so we see that um, Quick to See Smith's version of the pipe is probably closer to the European style um, pipe of Magritte rather than the Native American peace pipe. The peace pipe is a smoking ceremonial pipe, but it was called peace pipes by Europeans. Um, it's a sacred object smoked for ceremonial occasions, it may have been smoked to seal a peace treaty or agreement. The other devi deviation from Rene Magritte's painting is the inclusion of General Custer um, in the plume of smoke drifting upwards from the pipe. Um, we can easily recognize him with his long curly hair and his long mustache. He was a US Army officer best known for his violent campaign, campaigns against the Southern Cheyenne during the 18, late 18, till the late 1860s and for his defeat and death at the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876. I wanted to include another installation shot of um, another time when Jean Quick to see Smith's work was here at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art and it was during the exhibition Memories of Childhood. This is back in the summer of 1997 and it was um, featuring all of the artists um, in Bernice Steinbaum's gallery from New York and Jean Quick to see Smith was included and um, Steinbaum had asked all of her artists to create 10 works um, based on memories of their childhood. We didn't buy any of Quick to see Smith's works out of the exhibition, but we did acquire 10 pieces by the Native American artist, Wayne Slick. Um, and we'll, what you'll notice just from a general sense, this um, view installation view on the right is Quick to see Smith's work is that there's a general openness more in her composition than what we saw in the pastel drawing dream time. Um, an artist that might come to mind when you look at Jean Quick to see Smith's work is Robert Rauschenberg, who began utilizing non-traditional found objects um, from pop culture in the 1950s. Um, we can get us as a collage in this, his sense of collage in this untitled print from our collection. So like Rauschenberg, she began juxtaposing disparate images and text as well. She included slices of life through cast off materials, clipped, clipped articles and photographs from newspapers and magazines. And so in her mixed media paintings, she would begin layering a collage of materials. Um, this approach you can kind of see as well in her prints, um, but the technique is a little bit different because the layering in prints um, has to be all done on your matrix ahead of time. It's not more so the layering of images rather than a layering of physical materials. But then like her painting, she will take use different types of mark making and improv improvise in her, her painting or her drawing to help unify these elements. In um, 1996, she created this survi the survival series um, and it's a group of four works that are in the collection. Um, the names, I guess that basically it's divided into things that are essential for survival. So at the top we have Top left, we have wisdom, knowledge. Next to it, we have tribe, community. Um, below that, we have nature, medicine on the left, lower left, and then we have humor. And these are all pretty good size at 36 by 24 inches. And sometimes an artist will choose to do a series, in this case, four pieces to explore an idea more in depth. So here again, we have wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge can be seen as information obtained by reading books, a very Western means of gaining, uh, means of learning. Um, you gain, in contrast, you gain wisdom through life experience. And this one is entitled Tribe Community. Um, and she explores the idea of community um, in different ways um, because it means different things to different people. What we have, um, appears to be a floor plans of a cathedral, four identical laid out in the form of a Latin cross, symbols of the European Christian centric worldview. We also see that she sketched a multitude of rabbit faces on the border, 
Um, we have essentially a placed standing rabbit. Um, he stands on his hind legs with arms on his hips, arms akimbo, sort of a great attitude. Maybe it's a very resilient, resilient figure. But rabbit is a trickster. He's best, the best known one is Br'er Rabbit, claimed by Southeastern tribes and African Americans. The rabbit appears in Cree, Ojibwe, and Chippewas, um, people's stories about the world's creation. Um, they appear in petroglyphs in the Americas. Um, different standing rabbits appear in the rocks at Petersboro site in Toronto, Canada. And ra rabbits just have, a, a, just in general, universal recognition. They're common in pop culture, literature, movies. They appear in Japanese woodblock prints, children's books like Peter Rabbit, even Jeff Koons's um, stainless steel balloon rabbit, um, and in books, even the Easter Bunny. So, but these are tricksters that guide her through her painting, she says, her dreams and her stories. They are her assistants, her posse. They make her see the flip side of life and its ironies. And so we see that Quick to See Smith combines all these very different historical, and also contemporary um, sources. Um, they seem jarring at time, but um, she tries to unify them all together. And she tries to keep her imagery kind of ambiguous. She wants us to try to figure out um, and take that time looking at her work um, and figure out what she's trying to communicate. This is humor. Unlike the other titles, humor only has one word in the title, perhaps. Um, it doesn't need further ex explanation. It's not surprising that humor is key to survival. It is, a, it is a staple of many of the artist's works. Um, she finds satire and irony to be an effective means of communicating her message. She says, I think people often can hear a message with humor much easier than with bitterness. And along the side, Along this side of the left side of the, her print, we see for a good time call 1-800-Coyote. And Coyote is another trickster. Um, he's part of the Salish creation story. Um, she says he is every human, foolish, bright, conniving, bene beneficent, helpful, greedy, and generous. Coyote is a trickster and is always turning everything around upside down. And even in the center may be kind of a way to show um, like the coyote in, in, in a hand shadow. Maybe that's, how, that's the best I can figure that part out. Here's a detail of the bottom. In the center appears to be a type fragment, possibly from a folktale with coyote and badger. We also have a steam engine train with a cow catcher in front. The train pushes forward as horses and native people flee. Um, I think this is Coyote again on this side though. And maybe he's the one saying, get your reservations now, which I cringe at when I read that because of the double-edged meaning of getting your reservations ticket-wise and off to um, native, native people being pushed into reservations. But the Transcontinental Railroad facilitated the colonization of Western territories by encouraging new settlements on indigenous lands. The U.S. Congress granted millions of acres of land to railroad companies. According to treaties ratified by Congress, these lands belong to different indigenous nations. In other words, Congress granted lands to railroad companies that are not legally under its control. And then we have um, one last piece in this series, Nature Medicine. And um, we have a very joyous uh, figure that seems almost reminiscent. This figure here the re in red uh, with the movement seems reminiscent of some of Henri Matisse's um, cutouts. Also, the figure playing the flute may seem a little reminiscent of um, Pablo Picasso's um, ceramic pieces. When I have examples of Matisse on the left and um, Picasso below him. Also, here's a detail at the bottom of the piece, and we can see faintly these um, figures on horse, horseback. Um, and it's, it seems to be a reference to 19th century drawings known as ledger art or ledger book drawings. 
Um, they're so named because they were drawn often on the ruled pages of old ledger books or accounting books that were acquired through gift, trade, or theft. Um, Native American artists would memorialize deeds and acts of bravery, battle, victory, and loss or customs. And we have an example to the right by Frank Henderson um, in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art that stylistically resembles what Jean Quictacy has at the bottom. And typically they were done using um, pencil and ink materials of, you know, not part of their culture. They were largely done on reservations or in prison. Um, quick to see Smith print is barely legible. It's almost like a, a palimpsest where the image was never erased or you know, there are still faint traces. It's almost like getting glimpses of the print's past kind of literally and figuratively as they barely show through. This is a much later work from 2005 entitled A Chart of the Human Body. Um, it's a woodcut and lithograph, and you can see the woodcut in this really wonderful grain pattern through this central figure. Um, it's a very abstracted torso um, with not a lot of detail to anatomically to it. On the background is this really beautiful radiant orange. Um, it's even more beautiful in person, and the, the body just seems to emanate this um, aura to it. But the kind of this truncated torso reminded me a lot of um, scientifically based anatomical pictures where, you know, the, the human skin is removed and key organs are identified and labeled. Except, you know, in Quick to See Smith's work, we, we really aren't given much information beyond the, the grain pattern of the interior view. So, and, but we have all these images surrounding the torso. Um, so it makes one wonder, is this, you know, her view, some kind of comment on what's, what can sustain life? And I have all these little images of um, kind of comparisons with what she has in her work. We have um, a Native American, example of Native American pottery. Um, I've given some examples, just some random examples to the left. Um, she, you're really reflects her great range of sources. Sometimes she's interested in comic books, even wallpaper design. Um, in this corner, which I've kind of covered up myself by my, my face, <laughs> um, this part is sort of reminiscent of maybe some of Moreau's sculptures with the biomorphic forms. Um, this part here is actually kind of a dual looking at the face in different ways, somewhat reminiscent of later prints by, prints and paintings by Pablo Picasso. And then at the bottom we have um, this kind of, this maybe uh, like a, not a serpent, but he has a tail, um, this kind of devilish figure reminiscent of Jose Guadalupe Posada. He's one of the most important and influential Mexican printmakers. And um, he was back at, he was working back in the 19th century and um, he's someone that Quick to See Smith um, has looked at, particularly because he, his work was always um, very political, protesting government policies, mocking up the upper class, um, and he would do this in broadsheet forms. It was meant for the, um, the populace. Um, we also have a bullseye here. Um, again, this is kind of, a, kind of an ambiguous, um, symbol. Um, it could be a bullseye. Or is, it, is it a target store symbol? Or is it a reference to Jasper Johns, um, who used targets in a, his, a lot of his works um, back then? And then also, um, we have a, a barcode over here. Um, that and if it is a target, um, you know, uh, brand, um, it might allude to uh, the commercial, you know, looking at Native Americans as commodities. And she, often in her other work, she alludes to this idea as well. An example of this would be Native Americans used as mascots. And I have one final piece um, that we own um, in the collection. It's entitled Trade Canoe, A Western Fantasy. And she did quite a few trade canoes. The first one was done in 1992. It was for 
the 500th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's um, voyage to the Americas. Um, this was promoted by the US government as a celebration. So in protest, she painted her first trade canoe. Um, it was entitled Trade, Gifts for Trading Land with White People. And it consisted of a painting of a large scale canoe and on the wall hanging above it were all types of found objects um, pointing towards the commercialization of Native American culture. Um, trade has been important in quick to see Smith's family history, dating back to her great, great, great grandmother down to her father, whether it was fa her family trading goods or as an artist trading information and messages in, in her work. And on the one hand, the canoe was an important form of transportation. Um, the canoes in her work resemble a birch bark canoe. Um, they were the most popular type of bark used to make them. And there is a history of trade canoes that came, that came, would come to the reservation with whiskey that contained lead or blankets infected with smallpox. And she's painted a range of trade canoes. Um, they all take the same format with the long canoe being filled with different objects. Uh, she did a trade canoe for the North Pole, which deals with climate change. Also trade canoe adrift. That one focuses on the plight of um, immigrant communities, specifically uh, Syri Syri Syrian refugees um, in that work. So in our piece, it's a Western fam fantasy. So it takes a very kind of lighthearted, um, it sounds lighthearted in the title, fantasy. Um, the meaning of the word is lacking in realism and something that comes out of our imagination. So in the canoe, um, she's loaded it with different objects, different images. We see a Native American dressed in buckskin clothing who holds an American flag and stands next to a long, the Lone Ranger we have down here, he's masked, um, suggested of the mythic imagery of the American West. Um, in her other work, she often includes Tonto as well, um, the Lone Ranger's faithful servant. Again, we have that horned serpent figure here with the tail. Um, she said the devil is an image that is depicted in paintings throughout history and particularly in religious paintings. Most wars are fought over religious differences, particularly our recent wars. There's also a bed of cacti. We have that, where, I, there it is, okay. And um, bison and elk, possibly, and, and an oil barrel, possibly pointing to the concerns of wildlife and the environment. And the environment, um, her concern for that is something that runs through many of her other works. Here's one more, one last photo of Jean um, in her studio. Um, recently, her name um, came up in all the headlines with her work, I See Red Target. It's an older painting from 1992, a mixed media work that became the first major painting by a Native American artist to enter the National Gallery of Arts permanent collection. Um, they had or, um, actually owned other works on paper, but this was the first really substantial major painting by a Native American artist in their collection. But her work can be found in other major museums, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Smithsonian, um, the Whitney Museum, and the Missoula Art Museum has the most comprehensive collection of her, of her prints. Um, they have a, an example of every work from, um, a work from every edition she's created. So if you Google her name, um, you'll see it come up frequently with plenty of interviews and articles um, that you can read up on her further. So um, unless there's further questions. We haven't had any, any questions, questions on Facebook. So um, I hope you enjoy this and please look her up further. You can see further examples of her trade canoes and different um, images that she's created. So go ahead. Thank you.